Welcome. Hey, Mr. Manager, we have some good presentations today. Yes, sir, we do. So, members of council, uh, mayor, uh, we have a series of uh, actually five briefings today. Uh, I might uh, just bring to your attention on the agenda and explain why the city council's briefing is listed last instead of first, and that that's because. Uh, the uh, chair of the Minority Business Council will be providing their update today, and they asked to go last because of business uh, meetings that they have, and so we changed that around. It's no slight to the council. Normally, you're first. Uh, we're going to start out with city manager's briefings, and we're going to talk about the residential parking permit program. Uh, Kathy Warren, our director of the Strategic Growth Area Office, is presenting today, has uh, staff with her. And it's really about giving some familiarization to the new members of the council about how the RPPP works, and then to uh, focus in on the Caval Cavalier Tours neighborhood, and then to conclude with the staff recommendation for their request. And as you recall, you will be uh, you will be having that on your agenda on 5 February as a deferred item. Uh, it wasn't, uh, it was established as a particular return on that date, and so we must hear it. Yeah. Okay, good afternoon, Mayor, Vice Mayor, members of Council. Um, as the manager stated, I'll be briefing you on the resident permit parking program and the Cavalier Shores neighborhood program request. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to introduce Rob Freeze also, who is the uh, manager of our parking administration. So in today's overview, we'll discuss the history of the RPP, its boundaries and purpose, then our policy for induction, current status of the program, current status of the Cavalier Shores request, and then finally providing a recommendation from staff and next steps. The resident permit parking program began in 1992 at the request of resort neighborhoods that were experiencing late night traffic and noise. The current boundaries are from Rudy Loop to 30th Street, and parking is not permitted between 8 p.m. and 6 a.m. Permits are issued by the Treasurer's Office, and the program is enforced by Republic Parking and the Virginia Beach Police Department. And this is just a map of the boundaries. To your west, of course, is 30th Street to the east. Rudy Loop. The program's purpose is to protect our resort neighborhoods from traffic congestion, unreasonable noise and disturbance throughout the late evening, early morning hours, as well as protecting residents from unreasonable burdens and gaining access to their residences. Above all, the intent is to protect and preserve peace, good order, and the character of our residential neighborhoods. In order to be inducted into the RPP policy, the neighborhood must be within a half mile of a parking meter. A petition must be signed by 75% of the parcel owners and must contain language summarizing the program's restrictions. The streets in the proposed neighborhood must be contiguous. For residential permits, one decal per vehicle with a max of four. The first two are free, the second two are $5 each, and a replacement cost of $2 for those that are lost. Two annual guest passes per residence and a max of 10 temporary guest permits, permit passes per week. Each has a 72-hour life cycle. For business employee passes, they are $10 a month for employees working after 8 p.m. and must be an employee of a pre-authorized business. Here are some statistics from the last three years. You'll note that we are slightly down for residential and guest passes and slightly up for temporary passes. A total of 8,062 passes were issued in 2018. For employee passes, in 2018, July had the highest amount of employee pass passes issued with 600. And you'll notice in the summer months, we're down each month from the previous year. In 2018, we surveyed the RPP program area during the season to see how many employees were parking within the RPP boundary after 8 p.m. 
and found that highest numbers of employees parking were in July on Fridays and Saturday nights, where you'll see 102 and 125 parking respectively. The RPP area has approximately 4,000 spaces. So on to Cavalier Shores. There are 123 properties in the neighborhood bound by the Atlantic Ocean. Yeah, Excuse me. Which is 4,000 spaces. Do you mean 4,000 spaces including parking lots or 4,000 on-street parking for which are eligible for permits? On-street eligible for permits. Okay, thank you. In Cavalier Shores, there are 123 properties in the neighborhood bound by the Atlantic Ocean to the east, 42nd Street to the south, Holly Road to the west, and 45th Street to the north. In March of 2017, Cavalier Shores submitted a request for admission into the RPP program, stating a concern over parking that may be generated from the Cavalier Hotel patrons and employees. They provided signatures from over 75% of the property owners and asked that the hours reflect a 5 p.m. start time and no employee parking. Because this was a change to the existing RPP program, which begins at 8 p.m., it requires council action. This request was deferred by council. Concerns were expressed about the, the request being inconsistent with the existing RPP program that operates between 8 p.m. and 6 a.m. and allows for employee parking. This is the deferral item you will be considering on February 5th. The community agreed with this deferral more data was collected, and during the summer of 2018, the neighborhood voiced concerns about the influx of construction workers that were parking in the neighborhood from 6 a.m. to 4 p.m. In the meantime, Cavalier Shores Oceanside, this is the area east of Atlantic, was admitted into the RPP at their request administratively, and Cavalier Shores Landside wanted to pursue a restricted parking district pilot program. So for Cavalier Shores, Oceanside, they submitted a petition to the city in August of 2018 for admission into the existing RPP program and were approved in October of 2018. So they are now in the RPP. Cavalier Shores Landside and this is on February 5th, the deferral item you will be considering is for admission into the RPP with operating hours of 5 p.m. to 8 a.m. with no employee parking. However, as I stated earlier, they are interested in pursuing a restricted parking program that allows for three-hour parking without a permit, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And again, this is due to the influx of construction workers on their streets. Mr. Moss. How many park on street parking spaces within this parameter versus a larger parameter? What's the total number of on street parking spaces? In the Cavalier Shores neighborhood? Yes, and what the permit was. Do you that? recall that number, Rob? Oh, uh, I think it was, I think we counted somewhere like 140 ish in that ballpark. Okay, and then we take off some net for the street calming, right? So, okay. Well, if we could have that on Tuesday, that would be great, just to have those definitive numbers. I think people would like to know what that number is, and then with the street calming, what the net would be. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Wood. What a follow-up. Follow up on that one because that was a question I was going to ask at the end. But since you brought it up, the other issue in in that area is um, encroachments into the right of way, which tends to be an issue <clears throat> on the north North Beach, where there are things there that prohibit people from parking and otherwise. Um, legal parking spaces. So I think we can't really evaluate it unless somebody also does a study of what sort of encroachments may, may be there because I know that people put big planters or boulders or fences and things like that right there and so that, that prohibits an otherwise legal parking space. Good point, Jim. Yeah, uh, Mr. Nyberg. Um, when you asked the question um, in Cavalier Shores, how many parking spaces, was that landside or oceanside or both? I was asking just the landside only. Just the landside only? Uh, the ocean side has very few. I would say probably maybe 25 to 30 tops. Okay. So you were just answering for the landside? Okay. And we will have those specific numbers for you. 
So on to our staff recommendation. Mrs. Oh, Henley sorry. has a question. Sorry. This, this request to have a three-hour parking 24-7 without a permit, I'm not sure what that is getting at and how it could be enforced. Or it's the construction work. Six to four, and then the people have no place I know, to park. but uh, so this would allow anybody to park for three hours. How, how are you going to tell how long somebody's been parking there? License plate readers. Like, yeah, right. There's no permit that License or no. plate reader, that's exactly what they do up in New Jersey and other places. They read the license plate. And they that's back. exactly right. <laughs> yes, we would enforce through the license plate readers. So uh, staff is recommending the Cavalier Shores be admitted immediately into the RPP, which is consistent with the resort area and Cavalier Shores Oceanside RPP. This will ensure that beachgoers will still be permitted to park during the day once we hit that season. We also recommend that staff work to find alternative sites for the hotel construction workers to park and that we continue to survey the neighborhood during the season to identify the success or lack thereof with the program, which will allow us to amend the program if needed. So, so if I might just amplify what uh, Kathy's saying is, management has great concern that we're going to create an exception to a long-standing program that we have had in place and that the difficulty with enforcement will certainly uh, arise. And it's also, uh, a prohibitor to those that want to park in the neighborhood and attend and go to the public beach that we have in other places. Uh, we certainly do understand that construction workers have been painful, have uh, accessed all the, have accessed public spaces in their neighborhood and that the, this has been a extremely difficult for them. But if you, uh, we are concerned that if you make that exception, and you will open the door for other neighborhoods who wish to pursue an exception. Um, they will come at you and the impact of this will roll back to the south where we've had the long-standing program. Yeah. Well, my concern is that when, if you say it for the residents can use it, but in fact the construction workers are out there six to four, the residents aren't able to use it because they're not going down there at six in the morning and parking their cars to go to the beach. So in reality, that sounds like it's doing something, but in reality, it's not a real availability because the people who live there themselves can't even get their own cars because a lot of those places have no what? On-site parking. We created this, this body as a whole. When we did the Cavalier, we imposed this situation on the community. They didn't volunteer for it. It isn't like it. other places. We took a conscious action caused all this construction, did all this stuff, we created the dysfunctional effect on their neighborhood. Now, maybe it's not forever, maybe for, it's for the time period of the construction, but it's hard to tell people who own a home that's an older neighborhood, historic neighborhood, in fact, that they can't even have enough places for their own places to park. People who have cars from the Cavalier park and leave them on the street for weeks on end in their neighborhood, and that is happening. That's not just hypothetical. And, but yet we say we can't make an exception because we are taking away residents' opportunity who live elsewhere in the city to come down there and park and use the beach, when in reality that's a ploy because those spaces aren't there to start with because they're being consumed from 6 to 4, and we're basically offloading the construction development that we permitted and we allowed and then said, well, you got to live with it. So I think there's a difference between setting an exception forever <clears throat> and saying a pilot program to see how we can mitigate and let the people who bear the cost of the construction bear the cost of providing parking. You know, there's other places in the country where they park people off at satellite and they bring them in on shuttle buses. Because why? <coughs> Their city regulations don't allow them to hoist or poist that adverse impact on neighborhoods. I, I think we've got the, the wrong perspective. And I think uh, you gotta know when being consistent is making a mistake. 
They're not asking for a permanent change. I think they were asking for a pilot program. Now, if you were coming in here telling us you actually had the alternative sites identified, but we're, if we have all these alternative sites, I'm sure we would have identified them before now because <laughs> there aren't that many alternative sites. So I think that's somewhat of a misleading proposition. So I know we're going to hear from the neighborhoods, but I don't think this isn't a question of making an exception from what we've done. This is making mitigation for a problem we created, this body created, and how to mitigate that in the short run. That construction is years. That's not you know just six months. That's a, a lot of construction. And now you're asking these people to deal with that. And I just think, from my perspective, I don't know if Barb made a good point about it's the three hour or the 24 seven. Maybe there's some room there. But the whole idea of that we're going to continue the process where construction workers can come in and park from 6 a.m. to 4 p.m. five days a week, and also people are, are offloading their residential cars from the Cavalier place and parking them in their places where people don't even have on-street parking. Now, if we've got infringements and easements, we need to look at that too to maximize the spaces. But I think we have to be more sensitive that we are our economic development strategy has put this adverse consequence on this neighborhood, and I think they do deserve some different consideration. And if it's going to be permanent, I had one thing, but they're only asking for a pilot. So what can be the big harm of looking at something for a year, given what they're suffering under? I know, I'm sure you've been down there, city manager. I'm, I've been down there myself, and I'm sure many of you councilors have seen that situation. It's not pretty, and if you live there, I don't think you'd be thinking I'd like to live with that for a year. That I gotta, I gotta get an Uber because I can't, I can't move my car. So I gotta get an Uber ride to a restaurant because I won't get my parking space back. Now that's that's pretty sad. And anyway, that's just uh, my take. Having seen it, I know there's two sides to every story, but we are the body that created that rezoning, did that development package that has created that impact on that neighborhood, and I think they deserve some mitigation more than what the standard policy would provide. David. Um, you had said that the uh, south side, the, sorry, the seaside of Cavalier Shores did enter the RPP. How is that working for them? Have we had any complaints? Have we had any <coughs> feedback from them? We, that... I had a conversation with one of their representatives last week. So far, so good. We're not into the season yet, so we'll wait and, and how, see How long summer. have they been admitted? Since October. Okay, so it's kind of early. Correct. Um, I guess I don't understand it. They, the workers leave at four. Yes, in the afternoon. Why would they need to? Um, why would they need to get an Uber if the parking is available at four? The people who live there, when they when they go out in the car in the morning during the day, if they go out during the day, uh -huh. which a lot of the older people do, if they move their car when they come back, there's no parking space until four. Till four or later, and then in the summertime, you got the people, sure. both the residents doing trying to do the beach traffic and the construction workers competing for a small number of spaces and when you look at the lot that there's no on-site parking for a number of them by the design of the neighborhood for cars to start with right there's got to be some recognition just misunderstood you said about dinner work. you said dinner and if everybody's gone by four i was just confused okay well, all, people people dinner dinner at three. <laughs> all, okay. all right did the neighborhood request a specific date for the pilot to conduct through? Yes, sir. There it is. Um, oh, okay. So, no, no, I mean, when it would be completed. They asked for a three-year pilot program. For a three-year pilot oh, no. program? Yes. Okay. And w what is staff's aversion to a temporary program? I, I mean, I understand that are, we're concerned about a precedent being set, but... Well, uh, to be honest with you, Ms. Abbott, we're, if we do this, just... This look, play this out. Uh, in all likelihood, we would probably take a look at closing down two of the four lanes on Atlantic Avenue and create on street parking so that construction vans and trucks, et cetera, could potentially uh, occupy that with their equipment so that they might be able to support the economy that we are trying to produce at the northern end of the resort. Um, that that's probably the only area uh, contingent to the work site that we could potentially find a replacement area and and it might provide even more than what we currently are occupying in that neighborhood to do that um, 
we believe that you can still function with the traffic on Atlantic Avenue. Um, it just is going to slow it down from 35, and most people are traveling somewhat more north of 35 in there. We'll probably bring them down to the 25 mile an hour range, but we can still have sufficiency of traffic to move north and south um, on Atlantic Avenue and create the volume of traffic or the volume of pa parking that will support that. Do you, have a, do you have a map of where you're specifically talking where we would create this parking? Well, it's, it's, we have four lanes right. that travel like this mm -hmm. on Atlantic Avenue, and we would take the outside lanes, mm -hmm. and we would turn, like, on street parking and move that along there. But how would that impact existing businesses? Well, there's, it's all residential. Oh, okay. It's all oh, resi that, okay. Sorry. It's all Sorry. residential from there northward. Okay. And, uh, you know, we wouldn't be allowed to park in front of driveways and that kind of thing. And we have to slow the traffic down, probably put a 25 mile, turn that construction, turn the window. But it would provide sufficiency to remove it. And, and, and it might be the win-win that would go there that would support doing a pilot. And you all, though, you have the authority to say, look, let's try it for a year instead of three years. You, if you're going to make an exception, you have to approve the exception. The current RPP is only administratively approvable if it stays within the confines that you have set up for the rest of the beach. So we give you all this two weeks in advance of when you're going to debate this or discuss this or make a vote. Uh, uh, for your consideration. And that would provide us time to provide you an exhibit that would demonstrate that on-street parking and the number of spaces that we might be able to create by providing this opportunity for them. Aaron, instead of making, um, I guess, an exception, why aren't we uh, allowing or implementing, or is it too late to implement off-site parking for the workers? Why, why don't we require them to, say, park at near the uh, pavilion or down there and have the developer bust them in and the morning or shuttle them in. And then that way we don't have to create a pilot for them and just, or make an exception. We can just have them bust in and eliminate the parking in general in the neighborhood. Well, I think Mr. Moss would be right. If they were in the regular program, the different, you can't differentiate, they would still be allowed to go in there and park because a pass isn't required during the daylight hours, so they would still occupy that. You can't force, you can't determine that a civilian car parking in a neighborhood is a worker car as opposed to a beachgoer car or anybody else. But if, if they're forced to be out of there in three-hour increments, then those workers are going to have to relocate to a more permanent location. They can't come off the job site and move cars. That's, that's not going to work for them. Uh, so creating additional space there. There'll only be so many parking spaces there. And then I, I assume that the developer is going to have to figure out a place to put the rest of them. Because they're going to get ticketed and towed if they're in that area. David. Are um, the construction workers already parking south side? I mean, seaside? Are they? Yes, but there's not a lot of parking over there. There's okay. not as much as there are on the west side of Atlantic. So it's working there, but land side, they're not in the program. Correct. Okay. What exactly is a pre-authorized business? Bob, can you help me with that? Basically, a pre-authorized <laughs> business is what we've been holding uh, strong to, is that the business is located at the 200 block between Atlantic Avenue and Pacific Avenue within the confines of the border of the RPP. Uh, we believe that when that uh, RPP was written back in the 90s, that was the intent. We have not allowed any businesses on the west side of Pacific to enter that program. So when you come in and say, I would need a support parking permit, first of all, you know, where do you work? And okay, and then do you have a letter or something, a letterhead from your boss saying that you actually are an employee and not just trying to get cheap parking? So those are, that's kind of what their city treasurer does is they look at that and they authorize it and they, they're okay. So we have a list in our database of all the approved businesses. And so really what they need to do now is just come in with a letter. Okay. Is it feasible that one of these uh, these contractors could get a, an approved business or no? Doubt it because that area is north of the RPP. Okay. 
tops at, I believe, yeah. 30th Street, maybe 29th Street. So they're a little bit 30th. out of the field. Okay. Okay. Okay, Lewis. One of the other things, I le I would agree, agree with what John has been saying to me. Uh, uh, I believe he's on it. He's got a good point. And the second point is the other thing you got to think about is that uh, you got the ca the empl actual employees of the new hotels uh, and uh, uh, of the current. Cavalier Hotel and all that, who are also parking in that neighborhood, and they're they're occupying those spaces all day long, is what they're doing, and and so the people who live there, I've driven down there, I've gone down there, gone up and down every one of the streets and and looked at all of them and so forth, and these people got a problem. We, we really need to try to solve that problem for them, and particularly while this construction is going on. And maybe we do it temporarily now, see how it works, and then look at it after the construction is finished. But they got a serious problem down there right now. Anybody else? Yeah, if I can make a comment, I think when you have a unique situation, you have to come up with unique, you know, uh, solutions for that. This is a very unique neighborhood in a lot of ways. It's a, hysteric, a historic neighborhood, and um, they really have a parking problem themselves naturally. And then from what I understand, even some of in the new homes that, that they can't park their F-150s in their driveways and their, you know, parking in this area. And I just think we have to be open-minded to the quality of life that these uh, folks are entitled to out there. And even if we try a solution, maybe, you know, on a temporary basis, it just may be worth the effort to see if we can, can create a win-win situation out there. But, you know, it's, um, you know, you know, parking is always going to be a challenge. But, you know, just me, that, you know, the uniqueness of their neighborhood, you know, requires a unique uh, solution. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Kathy. Uh, next, we have uh, the coastal program, uh, beach replenishment uh, briefing, uh, and hopefully Public Works and Phil Roars will be here to do that. As, Good afternoon. As I speak. Thank you. We are up and running. Well, good afternoon. I'm Phil Roars with the Department of Public Works. This is just an informational briefing. Um, for all of you, but perhaps more importantly for the new members, just a summary of our beach management, our beach replenishment program. The, the city takes beaches very seriously, and we have for a long time. Uh, we actually consider them infrastructure, uh, needing maintenance. We've been maintaining our resort oceanfront beach for over 60 years. Um, we, we're subject to long-term natural erosion, and as those beaches erode, we expose our, our properties and our infrastructure to damage from storms. Uh, we, we challenge our tourism industry if we don't have a pleasant enough beach uh, to, to attract that, that component. And then, of course, as to lifestyle for the citizens of Virginia Beach, uh, having an opportunity to go to a healthy beach is always very important. So what I'm going to do is, is uh, go through our various beaches. I'm going to show you a map here in a minute and then and summarize and, and, and answer any questions you might have. Just uh, for orientation, we'll run through this. I know you all know where these are, but I'll just give you what, what we call these beaches. Chesapeake Beach, of course, borders the fence there at Little Creek. Uh, east of it and on the west side of Lesnar or Lynn Haven Inlet is uh, Ocean Park Beach. Its sister beach is on the other side of the inlet. We call it Cape Henry Beach. As we come around the horn, we have the north end and the resort beach. This is the beach that's been actively managed since the 40s. We have a, a new project, Croatan Beach. And then finally, we have Sandbridge Beach. So what this map shows you is, is the public beaches that we manage. And you'll notice that except for the federal installations of Little Creek, uh, the, the state park at First Landing and the, um, the other base at Fort Story and, of course, Dam Neck. And down at the bottom, we've got National Wildlife Refuge and Falls Cape State Park. 
So we have it almost all under control. There's only one piece of beach left, and I can't point with this arrow, but it's in between Chesapeake Beach and Ocean Park Beach. It's a small beach we call Bay Lake Pines. Um, they have, as a neighborhood for years, relied upon an original subdivision plat of their neighborhood that reserved the beach exclusively for the owners of property within Bay Lake Pines. Probably wouldn't hold up in court. Um, it, it, it doesn't, it's not deep enough, doesn't go back to, to the, 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 a King's Grant or some other, some other real estate interest that will allow them to own the commons. But fortunately, Bay Lake Pines does not have an erosion problem. So until they have an erosion problem, we're, we're kind of letting that little small segment of beach uh, left in abeyance. So let me just walk you through, through quickly our program. Chesapeake Beach Restoration, uh, we, this was our last beach. It had been suffering erosion for decades, and uh, I, I know Mr. Jones had worked on this for more than a decade, meeting with the Civic League. Uh, it was at least 15 years I was involved in meeting with the Civic League, trying to document a public interest in the beach. But there were various claims. There were entire blocks of underwater <coughs> real estate that people actually had title to. And there were many lots that extended out and across the dry beach. Um, so we, we, we needed to resolve that. Uh, thankfully, with council support, we filed a court case in 17. It was ruled in our favor. The beach was de declared public. And after all those years of waiting, we hired a contractor, and he did it in three weeks. Uh, it was really quite, quite an event to, to see it. But the beach is so much more healthy now than it had been. We had bulkheads exposed. We were experiencing some damage. Um, and what we've been able to do is build a really nice beach out in front of them. Over to the inlet, the, the west side, of course, being Ocean Park Beach, the east side being Cape Henry Beach. Um, we have, it says historically, and, and, and it's really since 2000, we have been alternating placing the material from the Lynn Haven Inlet Federal Navigation Channel project. We've been placing that sand that's dredged out of the inlet alternatively on Cape Henry and Ocean Park Beach. Uh, this was following a, a similar court case uh, at, at Cape Henry Beach that was quite more protracted than the one at, at, at Chesapeake Beach, but we finally got a court ruling in our favor declaring the Cape Henry Beach public, so we were able to alternate these two. Uh, we have a dredging coming up this winter. It's already advertised. The contract is on the street. Looks like around 172,000 cubic yards will be made available to pump directly onto Cape Henry Beach and, and restore its dimensions. Um, council did approve uh, some months ago, and we have advanced. What the city is actually providing $750,000 of non-required local cost share to essentially plus up the federal budget on this project because they did not receive enough money to do a full depth dredging. They, would, they only had enough money to come back and hit the really shallow spots. By, by plussing them up and allowing them to dredge full depth, we get all the sand out of the channel we possibly can, giving us the, the most beach replenishment we can get and the deepest, longest service channel we can. Uh, so for those reasons, uh, council supported our recommendation and, and we're underway with that. Beyond just the inlet and the, the essentially free sand that comes from the federal project, uh, a project was introduced two years ago, Bay Beaches Resiliency Study and Restoration. And the idea here is, is that just using the inlet sand and alternating between these two beaches, that's a great way to use that sand, but we're not necessarily achieving a desired level of protection. We're not purposely maintaining those beaches at a dimension to give us protection from storms and to give us that recreational benefit. So this, this uh, authorized and funded a study that has been completed. Uh, we now have a design basis for a beach for our entire Chesapeake Bay shoreline. Um, it was funded to, I think, a total of four million. And with, uh, after the study and the permitting and so forth, our first effort is going to be to go to Ocean Park Beach. Now remember, we're doing Cape Henry Beach this winter. So our plan is to next year, with the funding provided in this project, go to Ocean Park Beach and raise it and widen it to, to that dimension that was studied and, and determined to be the most economical, best beach 
uh, for the value of the property behind it. And then we'll be asking for in the budget, it's subject to management, leadership team review, and the city manager's support, but Public Works did ask for uh, out-year funding above target so that we could go back and visit Cape Henry Beach on the east side of the inlet and, again, build it higher and wider than just that sand at the inlet would allow us. So that's what we're doing there. So, again, we've got just finished Chesapeake Beach this last May. We have um, Ocean, excuse me, Cape Henry Beach out to bid right now through the Lynn Haven project, and we plan next year to hit the Ocean Park Beach. Then coming around the, the, the Cape, this is the, 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 the big project that has been going on since the 40s. Um, in 2000, we switched from an annual truck haul to maintain the resort beach through truck haul replenishment to doing a major offshore mining operation. And we put 4 million cubic yards of sand on the beach in 2001 and just made it r remarkably different. A uh, little, little minutia in the coastal engineering world. When you, when you put a big volume of sand on a beach to recreate a former dimension, it's called restoration. You're restoring that beach. Once you've made a decision to restore that beach, when you come back periodically and keep it at that width with replenishment, just that's the way we talk in case, in case I ever confuse you. So it, too, is planned for a, a 2019 replenishment. It's not yet out to bid, but it will be soon. Um, this is cost shared federally with the, with the Corps of Engineers, 65% federal, 35% local. Uh, the Corps, somewhat surprisingly for us, received $17.6 million federal for their share of this replenishment in, in this coming calendar year. Um, we're very happy about that. It's been a very challenged program with all the priorities in the federal government and the, the difficulty they're having with budgeting and pulling things off. So we're looking forward to starting that this year. Croatan Beach is also a relatively new project. Um, we, we've we were authorized through the project to design and permit and construct a, a beach restoration project at Croatan to kind of take the dip out of the middle of the shoreline. Um, we, we've got the permit. We finished the design. We went out to bid in November, December, early December, and we're quite shocked by what happened at the bid process. Um, apparently, there's, there's so little sand available from inland borrow pits right now that they would have to go way west of here, I'm talking Suffolk or further, to actually get the sand. Uh, the bid price was literally five times what we've ever paid for sand. Uh, where we're used to paying $15 a cubic yard, the low bid was 77. Uh, so we couldn't afford it. Uh, we, we, we did do some great work this winter. Our operations crew went out and moved some 20,000 cubic yards out of the sand trap in the, in the inlet, in Rudy Inlet and placed that along the dunes and bolstered the dunes the whole length of the beach. This was meant to come back and build a beach out in front of it. We have a few alternatives we're exploring, a lot of regulatory questions, a lot of questions about our federal partners and whether or not we can do what we hope to do. Uh, hopefully we'll have some more information for you in the coming weeks. Lastly, on our tour is Sandbridge Beach. Um, I know Mrs. Henley was pretty dogged about this all fall, as well you should be, and, and here we are. We were supposed to have bid this in November. Um, so the Corps of Engineers is bidding it. This, too, is a federally funded cost-shared project. The federal government has not been as forthcoming or, or, or steadfast in funding this project, but luckily through our special service district, all the 1,500 homes at Sandbridge, all the properties down there, they pay an extra six cents per hundred that goes into the special service district to pay for sand, for Sandbridge. They also have a TIF, uh, and I'm sure we'll, we'll talk about that during the budget process. Uh, the TIF generally has excess funds that are declared surplus and returned to the general fund. But the TIF fills the small gap of the local sharing needed after we spend all the SSD money. So the plan here is we always spend the SSD money and whatever is needed uh, to finish the project uh, or to, to, to fully fund it comes from the TIF. Now, Mrs. Henley, we were supposed to bid this in November, and I think you've been informed. Um, BOEM, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, who owns all the minerals offshore where we're mining the sand, 
uh, is required a, a MOA, and they have continued to change the requirements of the MOA, and they did so in November and asked us to do some additional borrow site research, benthic type study of the borrow site. We've done that and it's completed, but now BOEM is part of the government shutdown and they're not answering the phone. So we, we, as soon as they can get back to work and review the package that's that has great. been sent to them, which is responsive to their last request, hopefully they'll be in a position to sign the MOA. The contract is otherwise ready to advertise unless and except a new requirement comes out of this, this final negotiation. Um, so, could I, could I ask yes, ma'am. I know that we have to have the core because they've got the permit, and it gets really crazier every year. It does. But, you know, that was supposed to have been a 65 percent federal, 35 percent right. local, and of course that's not a fact. Right. And so it's pretty much all local. It is. Uh, uh, but of course, every penny of the SSB has to go to sand and sand beach management. We do not divert any money from the SSD for any other use. Right. It's the TIF that is the, the backup to right. the SSD. And what is surplus then comes back to the city for allocation based on the formula. And so Correct. So. Correct. And, you know, ha I, I think that TIF is the... Is the um, safety net for Sandbridge. And it's, you know, it's really unfortunate that the feds have kind of gotten out of it where you talk long-term federal beach restoration and maintenance project. Yeah, it was a good idea when it was going to be 65% federal, but when it got to be all local, yeah. that's really heavy. Uh, but anyway, it's worked out well, and it's working well, except every time we go to do a replenishment, even though they're really not giving any federal money, they just keep piling on these new requirements and yeah. I mean that's a little bit unfair. How about our um, our, our senators up in Washington? I, I know that they've been supportive in the past. Have we they tried have. to do whatever we can? And we have had some help from our delegation you know, in the past years with regard to BOEM. They had been prior to BOEM. They were something else. MMS. And at one time MMS, now BOEM, charged us royalties for, for sand on a federal beach replenishment project to achieve federal projects, a federal agency was charging us. And I'm just happy to tell you that former delegate or former Congressman Pickett went to the mat on that and he got us our money back. He, 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 he put in special legislation the next year and made him pay us back. Um, so it's been, it's been troubling, but the answer to your question, it's not the core. You know, as, as much as, well. I mean, it, 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 and, and BOEM is doing what they believe in their heart to be the correct and proper thing to do, and it's hard to fault them. They consider themselves, by law, that before they let somebody use a national resource, they have to make sure there will be no harm. And, and, and it, it's kind of hard to argue with that kind of authority, uh, but they, they're worried about turtles, they're, they're worried about a variety of things that, that one might think wouldn't be in their lane, but it is, isn't that they're the landlords or, or the actual uh, appropriator of federal resources, so they need to make sure all the federal laws are complied with, including Endangered Species Act. Another point, though, to the oh, least thing is, under the new House rules they adopted, any increases in revenues must be identified either by offsets and something else or increase in taxes or fees. That's the PAYGO rule that the House adopted with the new House rules that governs the budget process. So that's going to make it harder to do what you would call congressional ads unless you have congressional cash or congressional offsets. So that's another factor that will enter into the budget for 21, I guess. Right. But unfortunately, I mean, this is this is a locally funded project. I mean, it's funded by the by Sandbridge, and it's you know it's it's so unique, but it seems to get all the obstacles every time there are yeah. obstacles, and um, and of course there are all those windows that you know at certain times when the turtles are hatching or no, laying yeah, their yeah, eggs and so forth coming. that you can't do the sand project. So yeah. there's just a, a, a narrow window that we have for doing it down there. Yes. I I just well. I know y'all are doing your best. Mr. Hamps. So, not, you know, just to add to all the confusion that we all have in managing 
Sam replenishment um, here in Virginia Beach. Um, the court didn't give us 17 and gave us three towards this, so it's 20 million, and we've we've ahead of schedule. We moved some monies around. We've got our car share. We're ready to go. We can't get them to answer the phone. We originally were going to do Sandbridge first, and then we were going to do the Big Beach, uh, the main resort. The main resort. Doesn't have any real war stoppers in front of it. It's pretty much ready to go. Uh, to help the council understand how important it is to keep these things synced up, it, it enables us to leverage uh, the industry's ability to look at uh, large projects in proximity to each other so that they can bid them, knowing that they mobilize for one, they can low. They can sharpen their pencils for the second project and bid that, and they can offset the demobilization against that project rather than a mob and a demob on both of those projects. And when you're talking about major dredges and plants and pipes and dozers and trucks and all the stuff it takes to do this, these are multi-million dollar mobilization work items and multi-million dollar demobilization and so they sharpen their pencils on the front edge and they sharpen their pencils on the back edge because they're getting a double project and not having to relocate from Savannah to Virginia Beach to you know someplace in New Jersey nothing that I'm not that I'm against New Jersey but the reality is thank you Dave so we're going to have to really I've got the team really saying okay let's do this we can still have the same concept but because we can't get the approvals to actually that prevent us and the core from allowing us to go to advertisement, uh, we're going to look at potentially switching that, which the core is, we had them in here Friday a week ago to walk the dog with us, so we understood that, and we can move forward with the resort, main resort advertisement, and hopefully the shutdown will, or, or will leverage just somebody, we'll pay the overtime, we'll probably pay the salaries to have the review and get the signature necessary to review. Uh, we're prepared to, to pay that federal salary to get them into the office to review the work that they asked us to do that we've completed. So nothing's easy, Miss Henley, and you know that and I know that, but the guys are, and gals are working really hard in public works. To make Is this going to bump up, though, the cost of the Sandbridge project? Not necessarily. Not necessarily coming second. You know, as Dave portrayed it, you know, they, they normally are going to try to secure the first bid and then and then sharpen their pencils to see if they can get the second one, too. So I, it shouldn't necessarily damage it. Um, and and Dave said it, and I don't know you know it, but the Fed did put $3.1 on the Sandbridge project for this time. So that's something. Um, so kind of in, in summary, you, you know, the key reason we treat beaches like infrastructure is they do provide storm protection. That's our buffer against the high waters in the energetic sea. Uh, clearly at Sandbridge, the resort, and even on the Chesapeake Bay beaches, it supports our tourism industry, and it gives everyone in the city an opportunity to enjoy our beaches. Uh, what's really exciting for us is within the 24-month period, we're going to have placed sand on all seven of our public beaches, and that's, that's really not happened before. And I guess a source of pride and, and, and uh, accomplishment, uh, back in 98, the City Council formed the Beaches and Waterways Advisory Commission and tasked them with formulating a beach management plan, which they did, and Council adopted in 2002. And with Croatan Beach Replenishment, we will have accomplished all the goals in that, in that beach management plan. And that's... When we when we did it in 2002, it seemed pretty lofty, and here we are. We're done. So, your team. Any questions? Well, just one more comment. You mentioned for Croatan, you were looking at a, a truck haul. We were. I mean, gosh, I thought those days were gone. Um, so it's such a small volume; it doesn't make much sense to do it any other way. But you must be looking. Well, I guess you have to have beach quality sand, and so that's why you've got to go to specific. Yeah. I know Sherwood Lakes was created because of the truck haul to the ocean front. We, we use their <laughs> sand quite a bit. That bar up it there. Yep. I, I sure hope we don't go back to looking for sand in Virginia Beach to put on the ocean. Well, you know, as far as our open ocean coast or our large projects, no, we wouldn't. But but Croatan was a 50,000 cubic yard contract. And we may have an alternative that involves Rudy Inlet, well, but it may. 
but as a standalone project, 50,000 cubic yards is not enough volume to warrant the huge mobilization costs and all the plant and equipment it takes to do it hydraulically and mine the ocean. Wasn't there some sand that was going to come out of building the additional drainage retention issues at Asheville Park? Wasn't that one of the issues there? Yeah. You know, uh, that? Was that not beach quality? Okay, I didn't know. I don't know if it's beach quality or not, but if it's available when we go to bid on some of these projects, it's certainly not off the table. Hey, David? Uh, when you're doing the beach replenishment uh, along the bay, how did that affect assessments? Does that? It does. Um, it's hard to say for sure, but it, of course it underpins a lot of property values. Beach replenishment does. Uh, the best example I can give you is Sandbridge, and, and a lot of things happened in the economy during this period of time, but in 1998, the value of the real estate at Sandbridge total value was around $200 million. It's, it's over a billion dollars 10 okay. years later, um, and public sewer made a difference. Uh, the, the, the change from, from Beach Cottage to McMansion made a difference, but those things wouldn't have been done if we didn't have a beach. Sure. Uh, so sure. it's... Um, second question I have is, is the 19 to 17.6 million, that's already been budgeted, right? So we are not... Okay. Third question, Croatan, um, why isn't there a cost share, a federal cost share, and, and why can't Croatan participate in that same offshore mining? I mean, it doesn't look like it's that far great, to me, but... Great question. So the federal shore protection program has undergone several evolutions, uh, most, most markedly during the first Bush administration, when they announced they weren't doing it anymore. So you either got yours before that date, and you were congressionally authorized and, and, and eligible for appropriation, or you're not. Now, there's been nationwide since 95, there's been one new start, a new project. Now, the federal formulation process could take an hour, but I won't. Yeah. But, but to determine whether or not there's a federal interest, you could almost take a look at Croatan and a napkin and go, no, there isn't. Because knowing what I know about what the federal government looks for, they want flood damage reduction. Well, we don't have any flooding damage in Croatan, necessarily. We haven't had any yet. Um, and there are only 80 oceanfront homes as opposed to Sandbridge, where there are 250 oceanfront homes. It's, it's, th those kinds of benefits end up mattering. What are, the, what are the possibilities of an SSD or TIF? Uh, Endless. In Endless. It's, it's, uh, it's a matter of, of whether or not the community can accept it and the, and the council has the will. Uh, do we know an order of magnitude of a study or anything on that? Well, for Croatan, we don't necessarily see it as a long-term replenishment project. This is more of a restoration project. It is somewhat self-replenishing as our sand moves from south to north in the net and you have Rudy Inlet kind of screeding it off and holding it on Croatan. But it had a dimple in it, and what we want to do is, is undimple it. Uh, but we don't see it as an ongoing, recurring replenishment that would justify an SSD. Okay. Although you did say, no, you were saying restoration and then replenishment. Correct. Okay. All right. Correct. So it's not a restoration. It, Correct. Just... it is a restoration, not a, not a long-term replenishment program. Okay. Fair enough. Okay. Anybody else? Very good. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you. That was a good brief. Thank you. 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 So uh, uh, next, uh, Alice Kelly, uh, our interim director of finance, and her team. Hi, Alice. Hi. Uh, we had to cut her out last year, uh, last uh, Tuesday, uh, for time elements. Uh, so she's back to uh, brief the interim financial uh, statement and uh, to uh, correct some information that was. Uh, not correct, but to explain some information that was on that chart that maybe some of you all actually identified. So, please. Mayor Dyer, City Council members, I'm pleased to present the City's interim FY19 six-month financial report for the General Fund, and I wanted to make sure that this is an overview of the General Fund. It's, it's presented on a cash basis, and it's unaudited. And one of the things that the city does is our finance department consistently reviews our numbers, both our revenue and expenses, but also our balance sheet accounts to make sure that during the year we're properly recording transactions. On the side two, oh, sorry, I don't know who's in, um, is the bu budget year-to-date revenue expenditures for the general fund through December 31st. We have three major sources of funds, of revenues, local, state, and federal. 
and as you can see, the current revenue streams are trending similar to previous years. Federal shutdown has not had an impact on federal revenue budgeted for the general fund. Now, as I say, it's, it's trending toward um, previous years. It's 42.4 percent. Revenue does not come in on a straight line basis. It comes in as it's billed and collected. So it's not a straight line, and we'll show that in a different chart. Our expenditures are the um, very similar. They're trending as same as last year's at 55.1 percent. They're not a straight line, as, uh, but they're a little bit more straight line than um, revenues are. Slide three is a pie chart that shows the amount of revenue received in FY 2019, and real estate is the largest chunk of that, that pie. The total revenue received is $5.18 million greater than FY 2018 and 38.2 greater than FY 17. Real estate taxes received are at 51.8 percent of budget, which is close to the previous year's results. Assessments are at 3.7 uh, percent, and the senior and disabled tax credits are at 15.7 million, which are up from 14.3 million in FY 2018. Personal property taxes are in line with the budget. The city installed a new revenue and billing system with the Commissioner of Revenue and the City Treasurer, and that's working very well, and we've been testing that. But the supplement bills were issued a little bit later this year than they were in the past, and they'll be due in March. Since we're recording on a cash basis, the revenue for these the supplements, which is about $5.5 will will be reflected in the statements when received, which will hopefully be in March. The general sales tax collected is up 1.4% from FY 2018. Hotel room taxes, um, due to some of the timing issues related to the implementation of the new RBS revenue and billing system, for both hotel and meal tax, some of the December collections were not posted until January. This was an unusual situation, and it won't really occur again because of the new installation of the RBS system. Therefore, hotel taxes should be about 728000 more than what was posted, which is a little bit higher than last year's hotel taxes. The same thing for restaurant and meal taxes. The, they're slightly, um, on this chart, they're slightly lower than last year, $32.6 million, but $3.4 million of December revenue is going to be posted in January, which equate, will equate to about $36 million for December. So the meal tax is about 51% of the budget, which is slightly higher than it was in FY 2018. On slide nine is the breakdown of the amounts collected for hotel and meal and the allocation for each fund for those types of taxes. Slide 10 is a pie chart of the general fund expenditures to date and by type of expenditures. And then on slide 11 is a trend of how expenditures and revenues are spent and received during the year. This is a two-year trend, and so expenditures are relatively evenly distributed throughout the year, but revenues are more closely tied to property tax billing and collections. So when reviewing financial information, what we like to do is compare the percentage collected to the percentage of the year that's gone by uh, and how it was collected in previous years versus one-twelfth of each month. So it's also important to note that while expenditures are kind of straight line, our revenues come in uh, bits and starts. So uh, we need to have a strong fund balance and good cash management practices to make sure that we have enough money to cover our expenditures. And so um, the next steps, we will have a January interim on February 20th. Um, we have a proposed budget due March, 20, March 26th, as uh, David Bradley had mentioned earlier. And our adopted budget is scheduled for March, May 14th. Any questions? I do. On section E in the booklet. Yes. When we moved away from to go into accrual and biweekly pay, it's much harder to look at these numbers and then try to do it annualized where the difference is. So can we get the number of pay periods that are covered by this? Because there's obviously so sure. many pay periods in the year, then I can better understand when you annualize how much we're really under executing, and you can't determine that from this as easily. Because this ends on 18 December, which I assume is a pay period. Oh, I think it's December 2018 is what it meant. It's not. I it's, but I know it's a cruel period, so it's not before the 15th it's, and the 15th. Right, it, it might have a few time. days. Yeah. So now it's a cruel. If I could just get number of pay periods that covers, okay. that'd be great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, David. 
Um, RB, you were talking about an RBS. Uh, the revenue and billing system. So that's the software system? It's a software system that the commissioner and the treasurer have okay, so implemented. That's the, it was a, it's a brand new system. It's, okay. it's a lot of major improvements to it, but we were we had to test it and make sure and things the, and were working. And that was, I understand there was a delay in getting the business taxes out as well. Is that that same? Uh, it, that possibly could posting? have been. Okay. Yeah. Same, I'm just thinking it was the same thing. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Ms. Henley. Um, at the regional meeting, planning district meeting last week, uh, the regional economists gave the economic report of the region. Yeah, I just remembered one of the things from that was that the hotel income was down. Regionally. 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 Uh, but it was, and I know that ours shows that we're still, we haven't fallen, but we're still up somewhat. The fall is really a posting. Uh, they didn't get them posted. The December numbers are there. If you added the three million, I think, uh, or maybe that was the restaurant, we would be. We were. We would still be showing an improvement over last year. So we would be at seventy-five percent collected if we had posted the last couple of days of December, and last year we were at seventy percent of the budget collected. I know that you know, Williamsburg, I guess, has been having problems for a while yes, and so forth. So I guess that might be contributor to the decline regionally, but are we seeing anything at all as far as anything in reduction to our hotel? I had a conversation at the beginning. Well, I had a conversation with the CVB, uh, the Convention Visitors Bureau, who kind of monitors with that pretty closely, and uh, he believes that the weather that we have had, this this incessant have to rain on a weekend weather that we keep having is, is starting to have an impact and we may see some results posted. Um, it's going to say it's not as strong as, as we had hoped it would be. We just need to keep an eye on that. Yep. John. In that remark, I know we had the five-year forecast back in November, but the Federal Reserve just issued their new beige book for all 11 districts. And they basically have downgraded all GDP growth numbers, which are also seen over Davos, too, on an international basis. So we might want to be taking a look to see what some of those indicators are, because we have been underperforming the national average. And if they're driving down the national average numbers, that should cascade down regionally. So maybe the regional people who are reading those big books or talking to the Richmond Federal Reserve and getting some inside indicators as to what those trend lines are. Okay. The region that doesn't look good. <laughs> right, and, and there's some lag. I, I mean, I know you all are excited to engage in economic prognostication, but there, our housing uh, our housing market right now is, and I wish Rosemary is here, she'd probably give us some good insight on there, but you know, we've lagged in the housing market and recovery, but that, that, that it's catching up as we speak. Uh, housing market that we have uh, currently in Virginia Beach pretty hot and things are selling quickly uh, if they're properly you know uh, uh, offered the the posting price and bidding wars are starting to take place we haven't seen those since the heated days of uh, you know 05 06 and well, so Fannie Mae just did issue a report here in January I just read it you can read the latest Fannie Mae report talking about national and regional trends and what the forecast is going forward based on income and interest rates. So you probably want to take that into effect as well. But it just came out. Okay, Lewis, Mr. Jones. I have a curious question. What was the lowest level that your general fund balance got to during last year? I don't know that offhand. Um, I know it ended at $114 million, um, but I don't know where it went. The lowest, and I could find that out. Just feel like to know. Good question. You know, we, we we always talk about the percentage and the total amount. Sure, sure. But we never know how close we get to the bottom there. Right. That's a good question. I I don't know, but no we also um, and it's not up on the slide, but we also look at cash every every month and make sure that we have enough I ask cash. The question is that if we ever do have a major catastrophe. Mm -hmm. I mean, a real major catastrophe, even worse than Matthew and so forth. Is what is what is our safety net sure. in terms of that, sure. that type of issue? So. And that's a very good point. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Hey, thank, right, thank you. you. Thank very you. good. Thank you very much. <coughs>
Let's also do cash fund. And, sure. And definitely. try to get some graphs put together to show that. But Fannie Mae put down Thank these really great boards. Uh, you probably see them. They're outstanding. The data, they're very data rich. That's a very good point you made. Okay. Correct. Good afternoon, everyone. Kevin Kemp and I will be taking you through the planning items to be considered by the council at your February 5th meeting. We have nine items for that meeting. All but one have been recommended for approval by staff and the planning commission. I'll take the first seven items and Kevin will take the last two. The first item is an application by Clear Creek Holdings, LLC, for conditional rezoning from R10 residential an I-1 light industrial to conditional I-1 light industrial. The 4.38 acre site is located in the Accident Potential Zone 2, APZ2, and is encumbered by a Navy easement which restricts certain land uses in the high noise zones near Naval Air Station Oceana. The applicant is requesting the rezoning in order to construct three one-story buildings containing a total of 38 industrial office warehouse units with ingress egress from S from South Birdneck Road. The application is consistent with uses permitted in the APZ2 and the Navy easement as well as compliant with recommendations for new development in the SeaTac suburban focus area and SEGA 1. One letter of opposition was received by the Planning Commission requesting a deferral because of concerns with adequate noticing as well as issues regarding traffic, flooding, and the rezoning of residential land to industrial along Birdneck Road Corridor. The Planning Commission voted 10 to nothing to recommend approval. Yes. The, yes. On the slide back. Yes. The building, the B2 building, right? what building is that? The, uh, right oh, that's, adjacent the, uh, to that's the city's uh, animal um, okay. shelter. I was trying to get yeah. oriented. Yeah, it's a very nice building. $13 million. How, <coughs> how far is uh, <laughs> how far is that located from the new, um, are, we, are we building a new um, development or a chip plant over there? No. Isn't that down the street? A little bit further up, yeah. Owl Creek, yeah. How, how far is that from there? You know, offhand, I don't know, but I can get that information for you. It's, is it on the exhibit? Yeah. The battery building? Yeah. The battery building? Pretty far down. GTS, that's correct. So, oh, it's not this right here? This is um, just south of that. Yeah, right there. It's in between. It, it's the old uh, golf course? That was pretty golf course. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we can confirm that for you when it comes Mrs. Henley. next. Have we double checked the notification? And we have. And yes, ma'am. Yes. Yes, we have. And we uh, forwarded both a copy of a map uh, to the citizen that showed who all received notice as well as provided their names and uh, confirmed for this person that indeed uh, the notices went out in a timely manner. That includes the CTAC Civic League, correct? I believe so, sir. Yes. Make sure it's true. I'll confirm that. <laughs> yeah. What is what is the yeah. Uh, yeah. what are they concerned about aside from notice? Um, I think, frankly, the the concerns really relate back to a um, a belief that there's an awful lot of industrial zoning rezoning taking place now along the road there, along this particular corridor, and that in their minds they feel it's changing perhaps the character of the area. But again, the fact that it's within the uh, accident potential zone two um, and within the Navy easement, there's not a lot of uses uh, that really are allowed in this area. Was the, was the applicant, did they recently purchase this land and now are asking for it or? I believe so, yes. So they bought knowing that they were I believe so, yes ma'am. Thank you. Yeah. Is this part of the opportunity zone, the federal opportunity zone running along uh, Birdneck? Is this part of that? Uh, that I don't know, actually. I can look into that as well. I want to, did the, uh, I'm sorry, did the applicant, um, oh, yeah. did they know they were buying in a historic area, SeaTac? Yeah, that's a good question. It's a very old area, um, and it is historic in nature. 
Uh, again, I think they felt they looking at the zoning, looking at the character of the surrounding area, looking at the proximity to nearby residential areas, they felt that this would be a compatible use. And I guess three single storage building proposed for seeing uh, what are, they just want to what do they want to house there? Like? Well, they're going to be uh, I think they imagine that they're incubator type space. So each unit is relatively small in size. They're only one story in height. Um, they don't have specific uses lined up yet. Uh, this is being done on a speculative basis, mm -hmm. but I think it's their intent uh, to locate office and light industrial and incubator type spaces in this, this particular development. This, I'm sorry, because it doesn't look like office at all. Right. It, it's, it looks, frankly, more like a uh, light industrial warehouse. That, right. Mm -hmm. I, the, the, there are uh, you could keep another storage unit. There are roll-up doors. Warehouse, you can see it. It's right. got a storefront there. Yeah. yeah, I see it. Yeah. Is, Aaron, okay. Isn't there um, another storage unit maybe not far from down there, right? Uh, Self-storage unit? Yeah. I believe so, yes. Okay, and I'm, I believe so. Back in there, they, they have a car detailing shop down there. They have storage for automotives. Is this supposed to be the same thing? No. Or it could be the same thing? No. Um, I think, again, they, they imagine that this will be more of... Um, it's, it's difficult to tell exactly what they think they may end up with in terms of, of tenants because tenants aren't lined up yet. So they have uh, this notion that it will be incubator, light warehouse, office type space. Okay. They have no tenants lined up. Mr. Wood. Yeah, it's, it's office warehouse. If you can see right there, you can see the storefront glass and that upper right-hand picture uh, rendering up there. And, and I think it's important, particularly for the new folks, to, to see that one, that second bullet point there. Um, because those of us who have been, been on the council for a while, APZ2, and the Navy restrictive easements, they, that's very strict about what can and can't go there. I'm sure the restrictive easement is residential, um, probably a number of other businesses. And, of course, APZ, APZ2 is access potential zone, too. So it's part of our, um, our agreement with the Navy that, that we won't allow anything incompatible to go there. So it, it's not, it's not self-storage, because correct me if I'm wrong, if it's self-storage, this would be a separate conditional use That's correct. project. Yeah, That's so, correct. So th this is for individual businesses and barbers, so kind of like Cleveland Street. So the kind of stuff you see okay. you see up there where, where you'll see a glass storefront mm -hmm. next to a roll-up door. This is what's already down there. Yeah, they yeah, have yeah, the yeah. yeah. it's, it's, it's right near the other one. Yeah. And all those others that are there. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions at this point? Okay, thank you. The, uh, the next item is uh, a request for conditional rezoning from B1 neighborhood business to conditional B2 community business, a conditional use permit for a tattoo parlor and a subdivision variance. Tattoo parlors are not permitted in the B1 neighborhood business district, so the rezoning is required as is a conditional use permit. A subdivision variance to lot width is also needed as the lot width is measured from the smallest portion of the property along a right-of-way, which in this case is Lord Dunmore Drive. There's only 25 feet along Lord Dunmore rather than the 100 feet that's required under the B2 requirements. There were two speakers in opposition at the Planning Commission hearing who noted concerns regarding traffic, particularly as it may impact Walton Drive. Now, there's actually no ingress-egress onto Walton Drive from the, the shopping center itself, but the citizens uh, still were concerned about possible traffic into their community. The Planning Commission voted 10 to 0 to recommend approval. The, their only concern was traffic? Traffic, yes. That was their stated concern. Thank you. Yeah. <coughs> Are we going to verbatim of what they said? At the oh, certainly. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. May I ask, is this a... A true tattoo parlor, or is this a beauty parlor that wants to do tattoos? This is this, seven cities. This will be a true tattoo parlor. Uh, they'll have um, three <laughs> artists, if you will, a tattoo artist on staff, and uh, the business will be by appointment only. 
uh, during the day, but uh, the sense I have is that it is a true tattoo parlor as opposed to some sort of cosmetic type facility. Okay. Jess? See, um, you said how, how many artists did you say? I they? believe three. Three artists right. by mm -hmm. appointment only? By appointment do you, only, do they, yes. And I assume in, the, in our formal packet we'll have what the estimated impact traffic was. I mean, I, it's, it, it it's, can't be any more than what's already there. It's, it's very nominal. Uh, of all the uses in the shopping center, my guess is it's probably the least amount of traffic generated oh, yeah. by this use. Thank you. Yeah. And the hours are 10 to 7, so somewhat limited as compared to the rest of the, the shopping center. <laughs> the, uh, the next item is a request for a conditional use permit. This is a request for a garage which will provide maintenance services such as oil changes, air conditioning, tire installation. The applicant does not intend to do any body work, painting, or overhauling of transmissions on site. All repairs and storage of materials will occur within the building. Staff is not aware of any opposition, and the Planning Commission voted 10 to 0 to recommend approval. Next item is a request for a conditional use permit for an indoor-outdoor recreation facility. This request will permit the conversion of approximately 17,000 square feet of a former grocery store into a 24-hour fitness facility. Both indoor and outdoor training activities are proposed. Outdoor activities will be limited to small groups of up to 12 persons in a limited area at the back of the facility during daylight hours. There will be no speakers, monitors, or amplification of music outside. Staff is not aware of any opposition, and the Planning Commission recommended 10 nothing to recommend approval. Next item is a conditional rezoning application from the R7.5 Residential District to conditional A24 Apartments. The 1.6 acre parcel is comprised of three parcels for a total of 150 feet of road frontage along North Witch Duck Road. The applicant proposes to develop the properties with up to 28 units in two buildings. While the proposed density will be 17.5 units per acre, rezoning to the A24 apartment district is proposed rather than the A18 apartment district in order to permit a higher lot average coverage. Sorry. Development will drain into nearby Witch Duck Lake and the required stormwater management facility will be addressed at site plan review. I don't want to take up a lot of time, but I'd like yes, to sir. come back to understand, because as soon as you said that, it sounds like the that zoning gives them <coughs> allow the ability to have more impervious surface on right. their property, right. which seems to run counter to where we might, might want to go from a right. policy point of view. I'd like to really understand the sure. incremental difference in impervious surface under our stormwater management plan, what that generates. Okay, sure. Thank you very much. There was one speaker in opposition at the Planning Commission hearing. This person voiced concerns about cut-through traffic through his neighborhood. He lives on the opposite side of Witch Duck Road, as well as stormwater management concerns during storms. Planning Commission voted 10 to nothing to recommend approval. The uh, lot coverage, uh, and I can look up. I believe I have the precise number here. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's fine. Yes, but I'll certainly have those numbers for you. Yeah. Okay. It's a vacant piece of property. There's one house. It's three lots, uh, and on one of the three lots, there is a house, which I believe is currently occupied. Yeah. Next item is a conditional use permit for a family daycare home. The family daycare home shall be limited to a total of 12 children. Property includes an enclosed play yard in the front and side yards. Hours of operation will be from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., Monday through Friday. Staff is not aware of any opposition to this conditional use. Planning Commission voted 10 nothing to recommend approval. Ms. Henley? I know they have to meet state standards. We'll have that number for you. Sure. Check that. How many of the houses are all the twelve kids? No. No. Next item is a uh, request to permit signage for a commercial building within the Central Business Core, Business core District. 
The applicant seeks to install a six foot tall monument style freestanding sign on the southeast corner of the site adjacent to Virginia Beach Boulevard. The sign will be externally illuminated. The Central Business District Association's Design Review Committee considered the proposed sign and deemed it compliant with the applicable Central Business Core Design Guidelines. There was one speaker at the Planning Commission meeting who, while not specifically in opposition, noted that when his client's property is redeveloped, his client's property is right here, that this proposed sign would not be seen in the future by traffic in the westbound direction. Planning Commission also voiced concerns that the sign is not in keeping with the urban streetscape and character envisioned by the Central Business Corps of Town Center. And as such, they voted 9 to 1, recommending denial. Now, if there are no questions, I'll turn it over to Kevin. Hi, Mr. Wood. Yes, sir. So, and, and this is probably a, a Kevin question here. So, on this, this existing building has some fairly significant signage mounted on it for the one current occupant of it. So, and then looking at that monument sign, it appears that that same tenant in that case would have additional monument sign space, as would two additional ones. So does that minimize the amount of square footage of signage for these future tenants um, on the building? You can approve, council can approve whatever they want as far as a freestanding sign. It does not limit the amount of building sign. Each tenant is allowed one building sign um, as long as it's mounted on space occupied by the tenant. I know the tenant in the far unit, for visibility purposes, has chosen to mount that sign on the back side of the building and not over the entryway. Um, but this would not impact the amount of signage for the other tenants. The reason tenants. I say that it's very difficult to even figure out where the other tenants are on that building. They're in the back right. behind. I, I know. You kind of have to <laughs> yeah. squeeze around back there to see it. You really can't see it from the road. And, and I, I talked to some of the planning commissioners because I thought it was odd that it was a, a nine to one vote against staff recommendation, CBD um, recommendation. I, I share the concern about the, that sign being blocked pretty much immediately as soon as that, that parcel is developed because if that parcel is developed in accordance with CBD guidelines, everything's going to be pushed up to the street, which means you're only going to see that sign if you're heading east right. and looking across the street. So uh, that's that's a, a question I have. But um, can, can we make sure we get the verbatim on that one yes. as well? Yes, thank you. We'll do. And can we get the site plan or whatever we think is going to happen on the other site? That would be that would be important to see. Just how it, just the configuration of it would be helpful. Even if it was the, notion, uh, even if it was notional. Would be helpful. Okay, if they have any plans, you'd like to see them. Yep. Sure. Okay. If it's, if it's the same thing as that building, you see where. It's and this going. building stuff up on the street is uh, not got the results we thought it would. We've got some really ugly looks from that. All right. These last two items we'll review are both ordinance changes. Uh, this first one is a change to the floodplain ordinance. It simply adds a definition. The definition of repetitive loss. Uh, no regulations are included in this. What this allows by adding that definition is for our citizens to uh, have the capability to obtain additional federal money should they want to elevate or demolish uh, their home if it's subject to repetitive loss. Okay, Jess. So we're, only, we're updating the definition. Really, this is kind of just a point for moving, for moving into the future. When we have these... Um, come up on our planning and our packet. Can we have the what is actually proposed with it? I don't know, maybe I'm getting, because I get my digital, but I don't, all I saw was an ordinance to amend section 1.3 of the floodplain ordinance. I don't have anything like that, so I would have liked to have okay. Absolutely. a chance to review that. But we're only updating the definition. Yes, we are just adding a definition of repetitive loss into the, the ordinance. That's the definition is a flood related damages to a structure sustained on two separate occasions during a 10 year period for which the cost of the repairs at the time of each flood event on average equals or exceeds 25% of the market value of the structure before the damages were sustained. Is there a reason, is there a reason why we chose market value versus assessed value? And, I'm just on, and when you say market value, I'm just asking when you say that, how is that being determined? We know an assessed value of methodology, we may 
disagree with the methodology, but it's consistently applied. But market value absent an appraisal close to the time of the event is a more ambiguous term. I'm just trying to right. What, and what, I'm not sure of the details. I do know that that comes from FEMA and so the definition that they use. That then because FEMA's definition is not market value, it's replacement value. Absolutely. I'd be happy to clarify that for you. Super. Thank you. Good. Thank you. All right. And the last ordinance is the fence ordinance. Uh, this came before you, I think, two months ago. Some questions came up at the hearing, so we took it back. Um, you know, city attorney uh, and zoning, we worked on it and made some clarifications. So the way the ordinance is written now, it is similar to what you saw before, where a permit is required for any fence on the yard, except that we changed it such that in the rear and side, if it's adjacent to other private property, it's a permit's only required if it is between separating those properties. If it's interior to the lot, then no permit would be required. And we specifically exempted things such as uh, uh, hedgerows, garden fences, dog walks, and that sort of. So if your house is 80 feet off the street and the right-of-way ends, you could actually have a fence in your front yard and not require a permit? If it was not adjacent, directly adjacent to your neighboring property, correct? Right. Yes. And we also included, um, you know, right now fences, always, or permits always required for the first 30 feet. We kept that in there. Um, and then a permit's good for 180 days. Uh, if you don't act on it, then they would need a new permit. Jess? I'm gonna, I know I've asked you this question before, but I can't keep it in my mind. What it, If I want to put a fence on my property, what is the process today? Today, the process is you would go to the zoning office uh, with a site survey. Today, if the fence is located within 30 feet of a public right-of-way, a permit would be required. Uh, we would mark down the location of the fence on the permit and issue the permit. Uh, it's a $35.60 charge for the permit. But if it's not within a 30-foot right-of-way? If it's not within 30 feet currently, you do not, we would not issue or require a permit. Correct. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you much. Thank Appreciate you. Appreciate staff doing that. Okay. Now yeah, we welcome the Minority Business Council. Sheila, yes. welcome. Front yard then. I've got 1.2 acres. So, Madam Vice Chair. <laughs> Not yeah, anymore. Previous. Previous Madam Vice Chair. Resigned in December. So, resigned in December. So, um, <laughs> Mayor, members of Council, I'd like to introduce our NBC My Chair, house. Sheila Johnson. I'd like to go out. She is here to provide your annual report. Thank you so much, Dave. I was going to say the same thing, but I really appreciate that. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Mayor Dyer and council members. It is great to be here. And so we're going to walk you through the NBC's annual report. Lavera, if you can, go to the next page. This is just, uh, you know, we wanted to include those uh, members, those associates, those uh, city council liaisons, and of course the school board liaison. These are the individuals that not only give of their time, but also their talent to ensure we push forward with the NBC's mission and vision. And of course, many of you all know that the NBC is the advisory agency to city council and the city manager with respect to the city's procurement policies and procedures uh, for small women, uh, service disabled and minority owned businesses. Uh, we have a signature event that takes place every year. It's usually in November. This year it was November 8th, 2018. It was at the Virginia Beach Convention Center. We had over 300 attendees and exhibitors at this particular event. Uh, this year's title was Forging Sustainable Diversity in the Marketplace. The keynote speaker was Dwayne Thompson. Many of you all know him as he is president and CEO of Sabrosa Foods. Uh, he had a great story as it relates to uh, moving forward in the marketplace. 
I'm just going to share a bit of his story. Uh, he <coughs> founded uh, his company that he didn't know it was a company at, at the time while he was a student in college <laughs> based on a need. He had something called acid reflux. It wasn't called that at the time. But he started to create salsas out of his uh, dorm room. So fast forward, the product sort of took off. Uh, Dwayne now has a multi-million dollar business, uh, and he is not only in the U.S., but around the world, uh, his product is being sold. And so some of the things that he left that were uh, very empowering, number one, he said, uh, find the need, first of all, never get up. Never give up, be persistent, and always take the meeting. So those were some things that we found that were very helpful uh, to the businesses that were in the room. Uh, the awardees for this particular year, the small business of the year was Professional Power Systems. The woman-owned business of the year was VIA Design Architects. The minority business of the year was RE Replacement Parts. The Service Disabled Veteran-Owned Business of the Year was uh, Terramina Enterprises. And then, of course, the Diversity Champion Award was Lisa Grassi, which is the Public Sector Account Manager at W.W. Granger. And so these are a few initiatives that we have for year 2019. So when we get into the first component as it relates to the disparity study, of course, we're waiting on what those recommendations recommendations are at this particular time. Our focus is to really take a look at those, evaluate those, and implement what we can. As it relates to the policy review, we are reviewing the shelter bidding and the small business insurance requirements. These are for city contracts. Again, we're reviewing them to see if, in fact, there are some changes or adjustments that we may be able to make uh, to remove some of the barriers for uh, organizations or those organizations that want to do business with the city. The next piece is the organizational partnerships. As you all know, we're focused on awareness. We want everyone to know about the Minority Business Council, what we do, how impactful we are, uh, for those businesses. So we have partnerships with a number of the chambers um, as well as um, uh, as well as this other organization that I have listed here, but I can't see it. And so, <laughs> and, and so we have a number of partnerships I want to share with that. And then also, as it relates to the reporting capabilities, we have been talking about the e procurement system for a while now. One of the reasons why we think this is so critical is because, number one, it will help us to be consistent as it relates to the reporting, make it easier to read, easier to understand, and therefore easily uh, focus on the numbers and to ensure that we're moving in the right direction. And so the next piece, at the, as the dots continue to fill in, the blue, of course, these are the, uh, the opportunities that we have participated in already. The green, of course, these are the partnerships with, uh, these are the partnerships that we've uh, participated in with economic development. And I must say that they have been a great partner as it relates to resources, opportunities, and assisting uh, those businesses um, that are interested in uh, moving forward with the city. And then, of course, the gold, uh, those are the participation, uh, the things that we have planned for year 2019. <coughs> and so the next piece will break down the expenditure summary re report. I'm going to have uh, Taylor Adams to come up and sort of walk us through this uh, as the former uh, finance administrator, operations administrator. Good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council. Uh, Mr. Hanson, hi, Rod. Uh, no, so this is the last time I get to do this because uh, <clears throat> as, a, as of the beginning of this fiscal year, Rebecca Key, who I'll recognize quickly, uh, assumed the role of purchasing agent and, of course, uh, Alice Kelly, our uh, interim finance director, is, is, is in the room as well. So working through this, <clears throat> we had another successful year from an expenditure standpoint, 
$23.7 million. I'll just call your attention to the green block there. $23.7 million in minority expenditures. Again, another all-time high for the city. As a percentage of total expenditures, uh, it is about three-tenths of a percent lower than what we presented to you last year. And, this, and you'll remember we, we said at 6.8 percent, we thought that we were getting near what would be a ceiling under our current program. Uh, I don't know that the data says that that's what, what has happened. We've certainly learned from the, from, the, uh, from the results we've seen of the disparity study already that there, uh, that there is work left to be done as it relates to where we can be, but uh, would still just offer that 6.5% still led the Commonwealth for, for fiscal year 18 as a percentage, and $23.7 million in minority expenditure was an all-time high for the city. Just to quickly talk about how that broke down, <clears throat> interestingly enough, goods and services, which had always been a leading indicator for us, um, was off a little this year. Uh, and, and why is that? Well, we, as an organization, we are consuming less paper. We are buying less. We are, um, all, of our, all of our office supplies flow through a minority-owned uh, contract, mi minority-owned business contract. And so, interestingly enough, as we are buying less paper, and as we are uh, buying fewer pens and things of that nature, we are seeing that volume fall through. And, 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 and we would, we don't have data to back this, but we would attribute this to, to efficiency gain through technology. Um, I will say one of the great things, not to steal Rebecca's thunder, but one of the great things that she has done in her early tenure here is she has found some other items that we were, that were decentralized on other contracts. And as those have matured, she has rolled them into the office supply contract. So, so we anticipate that that volume will be buoyed in 19, so a great idea. But, uh, um, but nonetheless, we, we, that we registered that effect in fiscal 18. The great news is construction performed higher than, uh, than, than we anticipated. As, as you all know, construction has been, has been our, real, our real challenge. And so what we can tell you is the job order contracts that we previewed, previewed for you in fiscal year 17, which was sort of where we we were tracking a federal model. It was a debundling effort. We, uh, we, were tra we were tracking a federal program. We were able to make, uh, in the first series, uh, two awards to minority-owned vendors, one to a woman-owned business. Um, I'm happy to report that, uh, with the help of Public Works, all three of those contracts reached their maximum possible value in the year. And, and in fact, it was great. Pu Public Works did a really nice job of managing these to the, uh, to the end because I think we... Um, they got to the point where as the fiscal year was finishing, they were finishing up the maximum value and were able to carry on working, renew these contracts. They're in force for this year as well and are continuing to perform. So uh, thanks to Public Works for, for assisting us with the management of those contracts, and we appreciate what that meant because it was a million dollars in new minority-owned contracting in general construction services, which, which was a great win for us. Um, and the, these were not awards. This, this, this is money out the door. Um, <clears throat> same is true. Uh, Rick's Concrete, who, you've, who you hear us mention every year, the, uh, the first annual services contract that, uh, that, was, uh, that was won by a minority company in a prime capacity um, using our bond waiver provision. Uh, again, we, we were able, uh, Rick was great to come back. We were able to renew that contract again, and we took it to its maximum value. So, so again, that, that's really a quick summary of what's here. Um, I can tell you this is probably the last year that you will see information from us presented this way. You'll remember part of the disparity study is we'll be shifting from what is an expenditure-based year-over-year number to a five-year rolling average based on how, what we awarded and then how we performed against those awards. So it'll be a sort of broader look that... Uh, that will also be more sector focused. How did we do in construction specifically? How did we do in goods and services specifically? But Rebecca will have all of that for you next year. Um, I will tell you, it, is, it has been a, a great joy to, uh, to work on this program over the last three years and just want to say thank you to the, uh, to the Minority Business Council and to Rebecca, and certainly I plan to stay engaged as well. Shannon. Oh, I can, um, I can wait, but... It well, since I have the floor, do you know when do we have an idea of when we're going to get the next report on the minor, um, the disparity study? We do. 
It is. It's, fe it's February fifth. Fifth. Okay. I don't want to jump ahead of the finance team, but it's it's February fifth, and we we have confirmed. Samir, uh, Samir knows that date. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. If there's no other questions from me, I'll I'll turn it back over to Sheila. Or you want me to keep going? Keep going. Keep going. Yeah, All right. I'm here with you. Yes. Okay. <laughs> So quickly, you'll just see here's our year over year performance. Uh, you can see that the uh, um, again at uh, at 6.8 last year, that really was an all time high for us. But it, at 6.56, 6.5 again, we we're still performing in line with where with where we've been over the last three years. Oh, jumped. There we go. Um, just quickly, we continue to vote. We did two million dollars in. And sort of concrete, that's Rick. Um, demolition, HVAC, subcontracting. We're continuing to focus on these sectors because we're showing activity there. Um, or I should say Rebecca has continued focusing through the first half of this year. The job order contracting, the job order contracts are reviewed and are pressing forward. Um, medical supplies, um, technology services, and temporary staffing are areas where, uh, where again, these are contracts that, you, that were awarded in the last couple of years that are really starting to mature as these vendors are proving themselves and growing. Uh, temporary staffing has been around for a while. We heard about that during the disparity study. That's, a, that's Arvon staffing. That's a medical, <coughs> medical temp mm -hmm. service that is, that is used all over Hampton Roads and does, does a fantastic job. Okay, any questions? Aaron. Uh, so, fiscal year 17 was 6.8 percent. You said yes, it went sir. down to 6.5. That's right. But, and that's because of te technology. You say no. Well, so we, what happened is we spent more money overall, and so where, where our total percent, where our total uh, expenditures grew, um, our minority expenditures did not grow in line with that. We we dove into those numbers and found out that that yes that. The, that our losses were in two of our large contracts. We did not do as much medical staffing, medical temp staffing as we had in prior years, and our office supply numbers were off by about six hundred thousand. Significant. Yeah, and so, and so that, that's ultimately what caused that fall off. Okay, Shannon. Didn't the total for all of the programs, women's service, disabled, and minorities, increase? It did. The, percentage, the total percentage increase, just that minority one was the... Yes, ma'am, that is correct. Oh, thank you. Okay, thank you. Anybody that. else? Total dollars increased, and at the bottom of the good alarm chart... Yes, sir. If you look at... No? Oh, too far. Right there. Yep. Look, at, look at the millions at the bottom. See the millions at the bottom? That, and, and that just exemplifies that. We, we expended more in total, so therefore, even though we spent more dollars percentage-wise, and then carry to that 6.8 that Aaron was asking about. So, but, but the conversation um, here on goal setting and what the disparity study had had placed for us, um, just to, to remind the City Council that Council of, of Old had established a, a aspirational goal of 10%. And, and we didn't really understand all the dynamics that the disparity study brought to our attention. And so as Taylor and um, <coughs> Sheila and uh, Rebecca are going to all, we're going to turn our, our reporting, we're going to transform the way we look at that. And that which was a 10% goal, we realized should be somewhere in the 12.5%. Mm -hmm. That's right. 12.4, yes. somewhere in that dynamic. That's That's the passing grade that gets you to the 80 percentile that's considered what's that proper term significant um, so you it, we would be at utilization at, at yes at utilization at 80 percent of the available businesses that perf that are registered in the region not just in the city and so we're gonna we're gonna move our goals up and I'm sure uh, our consultant will be here to explain how we are to move our reporting that direction but, um, I got a yeah, Aaron. Sure. So you saying twelve point five percent? We want to push that up to utilization. 
we want to we want to push our goals up basically. By what we what we're believing is that by getting um, minority participation to and women owned yes. combined to a total of 12.10 instead of 10 percent that we thought we were right. because we're actually operating better than 10 percent. Uh, we're five years. That's right. By for the five year average. Uh, the rolling average, then by taking our uh, established goals at, to that probably 12.5 percent. Yes, sir. Uh, anything north of that will put us above that fully utilize, utilized grade of 80 percent, and we'll bring those charts back in and fully lay those out so that we can grade ourselves against what disparity study uh, metrics are, and, mm -hmm. and that was not something that we as a city had had, had used in the past. Mm -hmm. I guess my the point I'm, I'm, that I'm interested in, I guess, is, is what I want to highlight is that I think 12.5% total utilization puts us over the 80%, which is good, but we don't want to just be utilized at the 125 We want to be overachievers. So I want to push that, that higher. You can establish all the goals that okay. the council wants. I mean, but what, but what you're trying to do is you're trying to you're trying to meet um, an 80% utilization of what the available industry is that are owned by women and minorities. And at 80%, uh, that's, that's a sizable goal. Uh, I don't know that non-disparity study industries would, would reach that number, and in all likelihood, they wouldn't reach that number, but those aren't what the, the government perceives as um, standards for uh, meeting uh, minority goals. That's right, yes, sir. And so um, that's right. What 80% what utilization means is that over the course of that five-year window, we, issue, we would have issued a contract to 80% of the women or minority-owned businesses in our area that could have done business with us. And so that is, uh, that, and, but even more, in addition to being a, a challenging goal for us to achieve, um, what, what I would tell you is it's, that goal is really a com combination of five smaller goals that are sector-based. So there may very well be an opportunity for overperformance, assuming that we were to overperform in one of those sectors. But, but I would tell you, looking around the, the nation, it is, uh, it is rare, particularly uh, to, to, uh, to see people to see organizations get to that number quickly and stay there. Because, I mean, again, you're talking about a, uh, to, to Mr. Hansen's point, uh, it would be impossible for 80% of the majority-owned firms that wanted to do business with the city to win a contract over a five-year period. I mean, it was, uh, obviously, we try to be as open and transparent as we possibly can, but that's just, that is that is a big portion of a population. However, we, we're all in on achieving the goal. and. And we would love to, sh to blow those goals out of the water. The, the good news is if we do that, what happens is you look at a new five-year window and the goal, rose, the goal rolls up to the higher number. So that's, that's an important thing to note. We're, this is based on a, our new goals will be based on a five-year rolling average. So if we exceed the goal, then that new higher number rolls back into that next average and the goal is ever increasing. So... I think we should always just, you know, there's a saying that goes shoot for the moon if you miss, land amongst the stars. Sure. Yes, sir. So, uh, you know, I, I like to shoot for a higher percentage. Eighty percent, obviously, is great. It's, it's a lofty goal. But if we're not pushing ourselves, especially after we get the numbers back from the disparity study, then where are we really? So I think that's Thank our you. focus I like to. Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay, anybody else? If I could just say thank you so much to the Minority Business Council and over the last number of years working with you and seeing just a great dedicated bunch of people that represent our community in a very broad base, work collaboratively with our staff. It was just, just great watching the synergy between our dedicated staff and with these individuals that had that goal of keep on moving it. 
we're not there yet, but we've made some good strides and great strides over the years. And I got to compliment Taylor because since uh, he came on board, there's been some innovation and out of the box thinking, Absolutely. working with the leadership <coughs> and members of the Minority Business Council and just watching the chemistry of staff and concerned people. You know, I, t I, I tell you, this is uh, what good government's about, and I thank you very much for your dedication and continued hard work moving toward the goals Aaron mentioned. Thank you so much. You guys have a great evening. Sabrina. And, and I, I know you asked for other comments, but I'd also like to say thank you because you, you work hard as a team collectively, and the goals that you set, you're meeting, oh, and you're excelling in those goals. And I think it's very important, like you said, Mayor Dyer, it's engaging those businesses, bringing them to the table. That's where it's at. That's how you will supersede those goals as you continue to engage them. So thank you for your work, hard work and your efforts. It's been a pleasure working with you all. Thank you, Councilwoman. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anybody